it's true that I did say Christmas a few weeks ago and talking about Easter, and I was unaware of it, but I believe everybody that said I said that. And uh, so maybe, maybe Pastor Brian has something with that, but here's the real story. I think a few weeks ago, uh, kind of like the Groundhog Day, Pastor Weaver stuck his head out to see, test the weather, and it was the sun's reflection off his <laughs> top on here. And... Uh, Something about three more weeks of snow. That, that's all I know on the weekend, so. And Pastor Kerry, I did not, I was not referring to you with the beard and the, and the silly clothes. But when we get to that point, know that I'm not talking about, about Pastor Kerry. For those that don't know Pastor Kerry Huffman, he's just come on staff and uh, going to be working with our discipleship and training and equipping people. And we're glad to have you here, part of our team. They've been attending here for a, a number of years, and um, many of you know them. He was pastor here in Des Moines area when I came to New Hope 20-plus uh, years ago. And uh, my, I'm not uh, f as far along with the gray part of your hair than, uh, than, you know, and I don't have a beard, and, and I don't dress as nice as you, but I still love you. <laughs> Our hair was longer, yes. Well, it's an exciting day to be in church. What else are we going to do? Go build snowmen. Snow angels. You know, the farther north here, people are canceling church, and uh, so I'm thankful that we're able to be here. I'm glad that you uh, made the trek through the snow. There's not a lot of snow. We're Iowans. We can handle this. It's just not April snow, but it's what we got. We, can't, we have no control over it. So if you know this chorus, would you sing this chorus along with me? To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus, all I ask. To be like Him, all through life's journey, from earth to glory, all I ask. To be like Him. A lot of you know that chorus. It's been a long time, probably since you sang it. But I hope this morning that that is your prayer. That the prayer and the cry of your heart is that as a Christian, someone who calls themselves a Christian, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, that you would desire in your heart to be like Jesus. And that every day uh, you're, you're being challenged to grow, to become more and more like him, like the scripture says. Last week, we had Dr. Nunley, who is a professor at Evangel University, here with us, and there's a number of people interested in going to Israel. Uh, we're planning a trip for February. Um, and he made a comment about how so many people are so excited to go on this trip to Israel, all the trips he's taken and taken uh, tour groups with him, of people who just are so excited to walk in the places where Jesus walked. And he said, my challenge is not that they walk where Jesus walked, but to walk as Jesus walked. Walk like Jesus walks. And so this morning, I want us to just think of that and make that our, our goal, our challenge, our focus this morning, to be like Jesus, to walk like Jesus, to, um, in everything that he has for us, to, to fulfill his purpose and plan for our life. One Sunday, uh, this family was driving home from church, a little girl uh, asked her mother, said, Mommy, there's something my Sunday school teacher said that I just don't understand. And the mother said, Oh, what is that? The little girl replied, Well, my Sunday school teacher said that God is bigger than we are. And he said, God is so big that he can hold the whole world in his hands. Is that, is that true? Um, she said, Yes, honey, that's true. But Mommy, he also said that God comes to live inside of us when we accept Jesus as our Savior. Is that true too? Well, Yes, Sonny, she assured her that what the teacher said was true. With a puzzled look on her face, she said to her mom, she said, well, if God is, is, is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he show through us? And I think that's the point this morning that we want to, that we want to understand, is that if we are Christians, if we are like Christ, we are living christ likeness in our in our living that jesus ought to show through 
He ought to show through in our families, in our homes. He ought to show through in our personal life. He ought to show through in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, wherever we are, that Christ should show through us. He is bigger than we are, and he lives in us. And because he lives in us, he should live through us. There's a movie that I I saw years and years ago, and we watched it more times than I probably can count because my son loved the movie. Uh, It was Space Jam. How many of you remember the movie Space Jam? In Space Jam, these aliens come from outer space. Of course, you know, this is um, animated, but these aliens come from outer space, and uh, Charles Barkley and uh, Larry Bird, they, these aliens take their abilities out of them. And now these aliens who don't play basketball, all of a sudden now play basketball like Michael Jordan, play basketball like Charles Barkley. And, and uh, they're, because they're in them and living through them. And all of a sudden now Charles and, and Larry Bird, they can't play basketball, they can't dribble, they can't walk without tripping over their, their feet. But these aliens who took their ability, their ability's in them and now they're dunking the ball and doing all the crossovers and all that kind of stuff, and, and playing like, like stars. And I f- thought of that, and I'm thinking, you know, if, if Jesus could somehow get inside of us like Charles Barkley and like Larry Bird got inside of those aliens, that we could do the same kind of things that they did for Jesus. And the reality is, he is in us, and his Holy Spirit is in us and needs to be full in us and we literally can do the things Jesus did because of his spirit that's in us. How is it that we can't live Christ-like lives if we're letting him be full in us? And so uh, this is the challenge that I want us to, that I want us to to look at this morning, uh, to be like Jesus. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 16, he said, whenever someone comes uh, or turns to the Lord, when they accept Jesus as their savior, there's a veil that's taken away. And it goes on to say in verse 18, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. So that veil is gone and now we see him as he is. We see him and now we can reflect him because we see him as he is. The glory of the Lord can reflect through us. And the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. What, what needs to happen is a transformation. That transformation comes because of the, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ who lives in us and lives through us. We begin to reflect him so other people can see. Here's the point that we can draw out of that verse. As Christians, we're supposed to reflect Jesus. People should see him through us. People should say that they're able to see Jesus in us, in the things that we say, in the things that we do. And here's the, here's the other thing, is that every day we should be coming more and more like him. How many of us would say, every day I'm, I feel like I'm just growing more and more like, like Christ? The way we do that is we're reflecting him. The veil's gone and we're able to look at him. I want to ask you this question. Is Jesus showing through your life? Is Jesus showing through your life? Let me ask another question. How would things be different if Jesus came and took your place? Would things be different? So I'm thinking this morning as you're getting ready for church and you're uh, in the car coming to church, would, would things have been different if Jesus were in your place? If Jesus were to do your job at your workplace, would it be different at your workplace? Student, if Jesus were to sit in your desk, in your classroom, would, would it be different than if you were sitting in that chair? And I ask myself the same question. If Jesus were standing behind the pulpit today, how different would this be? We need Christ in us, and we need Christ through us. God's desire is for us to become more and more like him. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. You see, here's the thing. I think that too often we're trying to become like a lot of other people. We want to we dress like certain people. We want to have the things that other people have. We want the status that they have. We're trying to be more like other people that are around us, trying to raise our level of whatever it might be. We're trying to be like everybody else. But Paul says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So here's the deal. What are we looking to? What are we looking to do? Are we looking to people around us? Are we looking to the world around us to try to be more like them? Or is our goal and our purpose and our heart to be more like Jesus and every day becoming like him? You see, the world, this world that we live in is God's and everything in it. All seven plus billion people, we're God's creation. And his desire for all of his creation is for us to be uh, transformed into his image, to be like him. That's not just us who are sitting at New Hope this Sunday morning that, that that's what he wants for us. He wants that for all of his creation. We're talking about everybody on the planet. Even people who, ha- who are uh, pursuing a different religion, do you think that Jesus wants them to become more like him? They're his creation too. His desire is for all of us to be like him. For that transformation to happen, we need to be able to see Jesus. Paul said it's that reflection of being able to see him and reflecting him and becoming more and more like him. We have to see Jesus. But the eyes of so many people today are darkened, they're polluted because we live in a corrupt world. And so we're looking at a a world around us that's polluted, all kinds of moral decay, and... um, and there, if, if people are ever going to see Jesus, how, how are they going to do that in a world that's so dark? If they're going to see Jesus, maybe they can see him in us. They should be able to see Christ in us. That's why Paul challenges us to reflect Christ in our lives. And the more and more we reflect him, we become more like him, being transformed into his likeness. We must look like Jesus. What does it mean to look like Jesus? It's not like Pastor Kerry said, beards and crazy clothes that's not we know that's not what we're talking about Um, but we to be like him we need to to imitate him to imitate his character and his attitudes and it's exactly what Paul said to the early Christians in the Ephesian church he said imitate God chapter 5 verse verse 1 of Ephesians imitate God be imitators of God therefore in everything you do because you are his children imitate God See what he's doing and do what he does. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. There is, I, I, I can see in a lot of small children, and I noticed this recently with uh, uh, Pastor Austin and his son Sam, and uh, just a couple times I've seen him FaceTime and during the day, and he's talking to Sam, and, and I'll, I'll see, uh, overhear the uh, conversation, and Sam, uh, is, he'll, he'll say, I'm, I'm Austin. I'm Pastor Austin, and he, he's doing the things that, that his dad would do. You know, he's got his, uh, I don't know what he's doing with a golf club or a uh, ball glove or something, doing things to, to be his dad. And that's, uh, that's quite a compliment to a dad to have a child that wants to imitate and act like, you're, like you, but it comes with a lot of responsibility to realize that these young lives are looking at us and they're doing the things that we do makes me feel very responsible that, you know, there are people looking at me. And I'm not saying there's a lot of people wanting to be like me or imitate me, but here's what I really hope, that when people see me, they don't see me, but what they see is Jesus. And what comes through is not just Jeff and his personality and the stupid things that he does, which I do quite a bit, quite a bit of that, but that they would see Jesus, his love, his mercy, his character, all those types of things. Uh, we're to be imitators of him. That's a big, that's a big challenge to all of us. But when people look at Jesus, what did they see? They saw a man who was generous. He was generous with his time. He was generous with, with his, uh, with his love, uh, with his power. He was doing things for people all the time. Uh, When they saw Jesus, they saw someone not only who was generous, but he was genuine. He was genuine in his care and his compassion, his commitment to do the will of God. So I want you to think for a moment and consider this. What do people see when they look at us? What do people see when they, when they look at you? Do they see you being generous in the same ways that Jesus was generous? Do they see you being genuine in your faith and in your commitments? People also looked at Jesus and saw an incredible availability. You see, Jesus is one who would welcome anyone and and everyone who approached him, no matter if they were intelligent or illiterate. 
if they were childlike or childish, if they were prosperous or impoverished, if they were dedicated or desperate, they were seeker or sick, it doesn't matter. Jesus had such an open door into his heart and into his life that he got this label of a friend of sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. What better friend could anyone find than Jesus? What kind of friend do sinners find in us? Are we like Jesus? So the question is, do we, do we look like him? Do our lives, do our hearts, do our nature, do, do, do they reflect Jesus? Are we imitating him? We must make Jesus known by looking like him. I think we're way too concerned about looking like and acting like other people than being like Jesus. And I, and I wonder how we can call ourselves followers of Jesus if we're not really following him. It's tough to say, but consider that. Are we truly followers if we're not following him? What are we following? Not only are we to look like him, but we're to sound like Jesus. If our goal is to introduce people to Jesus, then we have to sound like Jesus. And so does our language, does, do our conversations, the attitudes of our, our, the words that we speak, do they reflect a heart filled with the power and the, and the love of the, of the Holy Spirit, the control of the Holy Spirit? You see, when people heard Jesus speak over and over in the scriptures, it says that they were amazed. Luke chapter 4, verse 36, it's a scene where Jesus had, had driven out a, a demon in the, in the, in the synagogue, and, and it says this in uh, Luke 4, 36, amazed the people exclaimed, what authority and power this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him, and they flee at his command. And the news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. The message version says it like this, Jesus was the talk of the town. Everybody was talking about this man who by his words was speaking and demons were, were cast out. They had to obey him. His comments, his teachings, his words, they had people talking. 1 Peter 2, 23, it says of Jesus that he didn't in retaliate when he was insulted, nor did he threaten revenge when he suffered. So we can help make Jesus known by sounding like him in responding likewise. 1 Corinthians 4.12, Paul says, we bless those who curse us. How many of you find that easy to do? You got somebody cursing at you? What's your response? What do you want your response to be? Okay? It's easy for us just to lash out and somebody's saying hurtful things to us just to lash back out and throw it right back at them. But Paul says, when, when, when we're insulted or when these kind of things come, we're to, we're, to, we're to bless those who curse us. He goes on to say, we're patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. It's tough to do. But listen, it's entirely possible if we're letting Jesus show through. If we're letting him live full and strong in us. Let him take over. Let him be himself. Several scriptures that deal with our, our language, the words that we speak, the, the attitudes and, and things that we have. Proverbs 4, 23, I'm just gonna fly through these. If you have a pencil, you can write them down or go back and watch the video. Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Matthew 12, 34 says, whatever's in your heart determines what you say. So out of the abundance of your heart is what your mouth, where your mouth speaks. And Proverbs 4.24 says, avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Ephesians 4.29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. That's what we want, to be encouraging with our words. Matthew 5.11, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, Jesus said. What he's talking about there is, you know, there's rules for foods and things like that that the Jewish people could and couldn't eat. 
And they were asking him questions about that. And he said, look, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. He said, you can put food in your mouth, it goes through your body, it comes out, that's all done. But he said, what comes out of your mouth? It comes from your heart, and that has potential to defile you. You're defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. It goes on to say in Matthew 15 that from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander. These are what defile you. Ephesians 5, 4, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. So when you're around the office or there's, uh, you're on the job site or whatever it is, and you know, it's easy just to kind of get in and participate in all of that. He said, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do or say, you do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So if you're a Christian, what you do and say represents Christ. Are you being a good witness? Are you being a good representation of Christ that lives inside of you? 1 Timothy 4.12, and Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on your young. He, he goes on to say, be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way that you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Set an example. You be the example. Raise the bar. You set the standard. Don't live by the standard that's around you. You set the standard. You set an example. And where does that example come from? We're following Christ. We're imitating Christ. The old WWJD fad that was going on is a real deal. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus respond? The only way we're going to know how to do that, we can't do that ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit being full and strong in us. We need Jesus to shine through. So our vocabulary, our conversations, our stories, our prayers, all of those things have to echo Jesus, echo his love, his compassion, his care. Our message has to be a message of hope. It has to be a message of transformation. This is who I was, this is what I am, this is who I am. This is what I used to do, now look at what, I, look, look at what I've become. And we're an example of the transformation that happens because of the presence and the power of Jesus and his Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to do what we couldn't do before. See, some people think that being a Christian, now all of a sudden I gotta act a certain way. Look, it's, it's not like this is, okay, now you're a Christian, now you gotta start doing these kind of things. No, but if you let Jesus into your life and let him be full in your life, and you're looking at him face to face and you're in his word and you know what he says about how to speak, all of a sudden you're gonna be conscious of those things and with the Holy Spirit through you, he's gonna say, whoa, up, 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 before you say that word. It's listening to the Holy Spirit. It's letting the Holy Spirit be in control. It's tough for us, we wanna be in control. And we think that we ought to be good enough. Look, you're not meant to be good enough to be spiritual enough. Jesus never intended that in the first place. He said, look, I've given you my Holy Spirit, a comforter, a helper. He'll be with you wherever you go. Give you courage, give you strength give you purpose, give you direction. The Holy Spirit is there. We just need to rely on him and let him be full in us. And when we live that kind of a way, it encourages those around us to want to know Jesus too. The way, that we're gonna, the way that we're gonna have friends, the way that we're gonna be popular, the way that we can make a difference in the world is to befriend everybody. That's what Jesus did. That's how we got this title, this label, a friend of sinners. But you set an example, be an example. You let his love shine through you and be who he wants you to be. They're only going to hear those words, uh, the, the words of Jesus, if we're the ones that are going to be able to speak it. They need to hear it from us. So not only do we need to look like Jesus, sound like Jesus, but we ought to act like Jesus. If we're going to be like him and be effective at introducing people to him, then we have to act like him. In John chapter 13, we got a great story, famous uh, account of Jesus with his disciples. Jesus wraps a towel around and begins to wash the feet of his disciples. And he demonstrates the heart and the actions of a servant. As we listen to what it says, this is in the message version, uh, John chapter 13, verse 12. 
After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe and he put it back on and he went back to his place at the table. And then he said, do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so, because that's what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, wash your feet, you must wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. He said, look, I'm giving you an example, and you ought to follow that example. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. He's saying, look, it should be obvious here. I'm the master, I'm the teacher, I'm doing this, and I'm being a servant to you. I'm not trying to earn brownie points, I'm not trying to be super spiritual, I'm just giving you an example to follow. And here's what he's saying, it's important that you serve one another. It's important that you don't get too proud in your own, your own person, that you serve other people just as I have come, not to be served, but to serve. Jesus, God himself, came to earth, humbled himself, Stepped from heaven, came to earth. He lived life here as a human. And he willingly submitted himself to die a cruel death on a cross, all to demonstrate his love for us. That's the example. He said, look, I've set, I've set a pattern for you, an example for you. What I've done, you do. He, and he tells us no greater love uh, can a man demonstrate than he lay down a life for a, his life for a friend. I'm not saying we have to die for one another, but we need to be willing to. Love that kind of way. It's following the pattern that Jesus set. At the very least, we need to serve each other. We don't have water and tubs here for you to wash feet today, and some of you are going, well, I'm very thankful for that. And it's not just the act of, of water and soap and feet. It's serving people however you can serve them. That's the pattern that Jesus gave to us. He says, a servant isn't ranked above his master, an employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. We're called to act as Jesus did, to give people God's promises, to serve people's needs, to love them with our hearts and to love them with our hands, to bring people into God's presence. There's a story that I came across and I've shared this before but the story is of a group of salesmen who went to a, a sales convention in Chicago, and uh, they assured their wives that they would be home for, for dinner on Friday, uh, plenty of time, but as they were rushing to get to their flight at the airport, tickets in their hands, briefcases in their hands, one of these salesmen inadvertently kicked over a table, a cart uh, filled with apples. And they hurried on without looking back, stopping, to do anything about it, they all managed to get to their plane and nearly missed their boarding time. They got there just in time, all except for one man. He paused, took a deep breath, and decided that he'd let his buddies go on without him. He would take a later flight. He returned back to the terminal where the apples were all over the floor, and he was glad he did, because that cart belonged to a 16-year-old girl who was blind. She was crying, tears running down her cheeks as she was on the floor groping to pick up the, the produce that was all over the floor. There was a crowd just swirling around the area and no one had stopped to help her. The salesman knelt down on the floor with her, gathered up the apples, put them back on the table, helped her organize the display. But as he did this, he noticed that there was several that were bruised and some that were broken and he put those in a bag and, uh, and when they were finished, he pulled out his wallet and said to her, Here, here's $40, I hope this I hope this uh, makes up for what we, what we accidentally did here, and I hope that this helps. And he began to walk away, and the girl called out to him. She said, Mr., and he paused. He turned around and looked into her blind eyes, and she replied to him. She said, are you Jesus? I wonder if people have ever mistaken us for Jesus. But isn't that the goal that we should have? Not that we could ever be Jesus. Not that perfection is the goal. But we should strive to be like him. If people see Jesus in us, maybe they can see Jesus in themselves. And that should be the goal. There's another story told of a missionary who had traveled to the South Pacific, called on a mission to go and share the, 
the, the, the good news of Jesus with people on this particular island in the South Pacific. And much like some of the missionaries that we've had here in the last few weeks, who their call is to go and possibly know that they may not return. This is the mission that this gentleman went on to this island. And uh, when he arrived at the island, he did not uh, initially open up his Bible and preach to them. Instead, he took time to learn their customs, and he loved them. He was humble. He was gentle. He forgave them when they did wrong. And after about two years of being there, he contracted a disease, and, and it took his life. About a year later, another missionary came to that same island, but his approach was different. He opened the Bible, and he began to teach the people about a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus to love people and die for their sins and provide eternal life for all who believe. And when they heard the story about Jesus, this is what they said, we know that man. He came here to live with us. He lived here about two years and he just died about a year ago. And the missionary said, no, Jesus lived over 2,000 years ago. He died on a cross. He was resurrected from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. And those people on that island said, then we want Jesus and we want him to come into our lives so that we can go to heaven someday. The thing is, is that original missionary who had gone there, had gone there and loved people and cared for them and ministered to them so much, even without telling them who Jesus was, that they mistook him for Jesus. They said, we, we, they became familiar as he was talking about who Jesus was. That that mistake would be made of people thinking about us. As we think about being like Jesus, what God has called us to do and to be. I think of some scriptures, 1 Peter 2, 21, God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. You know, even in our suffering, we can be like Christ. If we're going to be like Christ, guess what? I think that suffering is going to come. If we're going to become like Christ, didn't he suffer? It's okay to experience trouble. It's okay to experience difficulty, but how are we going to handle those things? To be like Jesus. God called you to do good even if, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. Just like a little boy following after his dad. We need to follow in the steps of Jesus. We need to do what he, what he has done. Ephesians 4.22 tells us uh, to throw off the old sinful nature, your former way of life. Instead, verse 23, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Philippians chapter 3, if the musicians would come, let me read this last scripture to you. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. This is Paul speaking. He's saying, follow my example. Learn from those uh, who follow our example. And what he's saying is, you know, at this time in the early church, there wasn't scriptures that they could pass around and read about Jesus. He's saying, look, I, I encountered Jesus myself, and, and here's what you can do. You can follow my example as I follow Christ. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. What are we thinking about? What are we pursuing? Are we so focused on things here on this earth that we're not truly following Jesus? They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they, they think only about life here on this earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ live, lives, and we eagerly wait him to return as our Savior. Are you looking to Jesus? Are you letting Jesus be full in you? I'd like for you to bow your heads with me this morning. And ask this question. Pastor Kerry mentioned it earlier when we were receiving communion. We know that Jesus Christ died, that he gave his life, he shed his blood. And that blood was shed so that there would be forgiveness of sins once and for forever. He did that for you to demonstrate his love for you so that you could live in this life with the hope of an eternal life to come through Jesus Christ. 
The only way to him, the only way to heaven is through Jesus. You don't have to be perfect to get to heaven. All you have to do is just open your heart and say, Jesus, come into my life and forgive me. Jesus paid the price. And he exchanges his righteousness for your sin. And now all of a sudden you have a place in his heaven. If there's someone here this morning and you're not on a path that's leading to heaven, but today you want to accept God's free gift of salvation, it's just a matter of opening your heart and saying, Jesus, come into my life. If that's you this morning, would you just raise a hand saying, I need Jesus in my life and I want to open my life to him. I want to open my heart to him today. Invite him to come in and be my Lord. Is there someone here across the room? Just raise your hand and hold it up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 